Um, I get to be the uh, cleanup hitter. Um, and uh, we're going to return now to the subject of disease modifying therapies. And I get to talk about the promise of future therapies. Oops, sir. Um, so I will in this talk actually take advantage of something I learned from Dr. DeLuca, and that is spacing. So I'll reiterate to a certain extent the, some of the points that were made by my colleagues earlier in the day. Why do we treat MS? We want to decrease the frequency and severity of attacks, but most importantly, we want to preserve neurological function, any neurological function, but particularly the things most impacted in MS, walking ability, visual function, cognitive function. You've seen this slide in a, a slightly different iteration from Dr. Lublin, but again, it indicates what's happening over time. Um, early on, we have frequent attacks and a lot of disease activity on the MRI scan as indicated by the yellow arrows. But over time, the MRI burden of the disease as indicated by the blue um, curve tends to increase one tends to lose brain volume, as indicated by the, the green curve, and the neurological deficit sometimes worsens. And it's that far right of the screen that we really want to prevent uh, with our therapies. Well, I'd like to get up now and tell you about the ideal therapy, a pill taken once a day or maybe even less often that's 100% effective in stopping MS attacks and preventing progressive neurological de deficit. The pill has absolutely no side effects and costs pennies a day. <laughs> if you came here for that today, I'm really afraid you're going to leave disappointed. <laughs> but nonetheless, that, that is our goal. If we go back to the time of Charcot in the mid-19th century, all the way up to 1992, well into the time when I was taking care of people with MS. That shows you the therapies that we had during that 150 or so years. Here's the landscape today as provided to you by Dr. Katz earlier this afternoon. And I'm gonna focus on the right-hand portion of this curve. And actually, uh, somebody who's challenged at working with PowerPoint, it was a tough task for me to, to change the red to the green on the teraflunamide or obagio uh, bar. But as you see, we now have nine um, FDA-approved products, eight different medications um, for, as disease-modifying therapies. And we have a, a half a dozen more in red here or so, well, five now that teraflunamide's moved to green, which are in phase three trials or have completed phase three trials. And we have many other agents that are in slightly earlier stages of development. Many of them are not on this slide. So, so the future is very bright indeed, I think, for the treatment of multiple sclerosis. As always, we have to balance benefit and risk. Dr. Katz showed you that the earlier therapies that we have, the interferons and glutyramer acetate copaxone, have modest efficacy. They reduce the average relapse rate by about a third. Many of our newer therapies, some already approved and some that I'll talk about during this segment, have greater effectiveness, upwards of 50%, even as high as 68% with, uh, with natalizumab, tisabri, and perhaps even higher with some agents to come. But they tend to come with added risk, and we always have to balance how much risk we want to take in order to gain that extra advantage, and when do we want to apply these riskier therapies. Now here we're using spacing that, that John told us about. So you've seen this slide before in a slightly earlier version from Dr. Katz. I'll give you uh, 15 seconds to memorize it. But <laughs> the reason it's up here is really to emphasize a point, and that is that each one of these um, whoops, I'm sorry. Each one of these areas of immunological impact is a target of opportunity. Some of them we're already utilizing. For instance, as you've heard, natalizumab works up here 
to block cells from getting through the blood-brain barrier into the central nervous system. But every one of these uh, targets is an opportunity that might enable us to develop pharmaco pharmacological approaches that will positively impact the course of MS. So I want to talk now about some of the specific agents that are under development or very close to approval um, to add to our therapeutic armamentarium. And the first is the third pill that will soon be added. This is a drug that doesn't even have a name yet. It's a biogenidec product, and so it's called BG12 still. It's an oral formulation of a simple chemical called dimethyl fumarate. And we believe the way it works is by protecting us against ox oxidative stress. Um, uh, oxidative products damage nerve cells, damage myelin, and this particular drug activates a pathway called the NERF2 pathway that protects against oxidative stress. Now, this drug is scheduled to be, um, to have a decision announced by the FDA at the end of March. Uh, it was postponed from the end of December, I understand, just for logistical issues, not for any problems. Um, so we hope that by the spring, this drug will be available. This is a drug that's administered twice a day. And whenever a new drug is introduced to the market, we have concerns about the safety because it's impossible that after clinical trials, we have the extent of information that we have for a drug that's been on the market for years. So we always have, have to balance that uncertainty about risk with, with the benefits. Uh, in the case of BG12, we have a little bit of added sense of security because a, rel a related drug has been on the market for many years in Germany to treat psoriasis with a good deal of safety. Uh, this is the, the data. Most of the phase three trials in relapsing remitting MS focus on what we refer to as annualized relapse rates. How many attacks on average will a person have in, in a year? And um, in this particular trial, uh, there were two, two different doses of BG12 tested in these trials. The first of uh, the two trials, as Fred told you earlier, the FDA generally, though not invariably, but generally requires two positive phase three trials before they're lic they'll license the drug. So the first of these pivotal trials for BG12 was called the DEFINE trial. And look at the relapse rate. It's under one attack in five years. That's pretty remarkable when we, we were beginning to test the interferons in Copaxone roughly 20 years ago. The annualized relapse rate in the placebo groups in those trials was about one attack per year. And now we're getting down to one attack every five years, which is quite remarkable. And this is about a 50% reduction compared to the placebo arm in this particular trial. Now, as I told you, we're always interested, ultimately, in being able to pre prevent neurological disability, to prevent worsening of the disease. And um, this is a difficult challenge to meet in a very short trial. The typical phase three trials are two-year trials. And the disease doesn't progress that rapidly. So in order to be able to show uh, improvement on disability is it, challenging. Uh, and not every drug that works in reducing relapses has been able to do it. In the DEFINE trial, there was a significant reduction in disability progression, as you can see by comparing the um, two purplish bars with the green placebo bar. Um, the, the second of the phase three trials with BG12, which was aptly named the CONFIRM trial, um, showed very similar results on relapse rate reduction, but didn't meet statistical significance in disability progression. But nonetheless, if you combine the pooled data from the two defined and confirmed trials, and these were extremely large trials for MS, they involved about 1,000 patients. To put that in perspective, the interferons and copaxone were licensed uh, on the basis of trials that included about 250 people, roughly half getting placebo and half getting the drug. So modern trials are much, much larger, so we not only get more safety information, but more reliable efficacy information. As uh, 
Dr. Katz said, uh, or Elisa maybe said, there's no, there's no drug that's a free ride. There always there always are side effects, and there are important, significant side effects like PML with Tysabri, but also tolerability side effects. And sometimes one doesn't really get a handle on how well tolerated a drug is from the clinical trials, because in clinical trials, both the patients who participate and the physicians and other personnel who are involved in the trial are very committed to keeping a patient in the trial. So patients will put up with a lot and physicians will encourage them to stay in. Once the drug gets on the market, you may find that a drug isn't as well tolerated. We hope that's not going to be the case. But there are some side effects with BG12, most commonly GI, some GI side effects, some nausea and vomiting in some patients and flushing, which occasionally can be tolerable, uh, can be troublesome. I'm told that, the, that these symptoms occur mainly early on and tend to go away if a patient can remain on the drug. Um, we personally have little, relatively little experience with BG12, having been involved in one clinical trial, but with limited numbers of patients. The good news is there was no serious risk of, uh, of uh, infections and minor white blood cell count changes. So this, this drug, I expect, is going to be very widely prescribed when it comes out, hopefully in the spring, and is another oral, oral option. Um, where it will stand in terms of its relationship to the frequency of use with Obagio uh, and Jelenia, the two other oral agents, remains to be seen and partly dependent on future safety information and tolerability information. Now I'm going to move to some drugs that are uh, not pronounceable. They have names, but they're, they're not pronounceable. Um, so anything that ends in MAB is what's called a monoclonal antibody. These are drugs directed against a particular protein that has some particular function. So natalizumab tysabri is a monoclonal antibody. And the next uh, monoclonal antibody that will probably approve is a, a drug called alemtuzumab. The trade name is going to be Lemtrada. Um, alemtuzumab actually was on the market uh, to treat unusual forms of leukemia, but now its main use will probably be in, in MS. Now, you'll remember throughout the day you've heard about B cells and, and T cells. These are two different forms of lymphocytes. Alemtuzumab is a drug that targets a protein that exists on the surface of both of these types of lymphocytes. And so both of these types of lymphocytes get destroyed when you give alemtuzumab. And they get destroyed for a very long time. So the way alemtuzumab is given is you take five days, five consecutive days of intravenous infusion, and then you show up again in a year. Not really, you come for checkups, but you don't get any more treatments for a year. Then at a year, you get three more days of treatments, and then you don't get any more treatments until something happens, until you start to see cells coming back or disease activity returning. So this is an exciting way to give a drug, but it also um, has issues. You can't take back this drug. Once you've given the course of treatment, you can't, you can't take it back, and you have limited options to employ other therapies. But this uh, drug, as I'll show you in a moment, appears to be um, very effective. All of the trials that we've uh, talked about today so far are trials against placebo, against dummy medicine. So you either take the real medicine or you take pretend medicine. The trials of alemtuzumab were not done against placebo. Rather, they were done against an accepted form of MS therapy um, known as Rebif, one of the interferons that's given three times a week. And Rebif, among the injectable drugs, is at least as effective as any, any of the others. Um, so what was uh, done in these trials, um, called the CARE-MS-1 trial and the CARE-MS-2 trials, is Lemtrada was compared against Rebif, and you can see from the uh, comparison of the purple bars to the chartreuse or whatever color that is, bars, um, had a more than 50% better response in terms of annualized relapse rate than did an accepted effective MS therapy. Again, reducing the relapse rate 
to less than one attack every five years. Now this is data from the CARE MS2 trial, which was a similar trial to the CARE MS1 trial, except it also included, um, uh, uh, well, it, it had a slightly different population of patients who were entered. Um, they weren't necessarily very, very mild, naive patients. But basically, the results of the annualized relapse rates were comparable. But here you can see, again, uh, as I showed you in the BG12 trial, a difference in the uh, amount of disability progression. And in this case, even there even was some improvement among patients taking alemtuzumab. Now, one couldn't prove this in the CARE-MS1 trial, but that may have been because the group of patients taking Rebif in that trial had very, very little progression. In that particular trial, there was very little worsening, even in the comparator group. So even though the alemtuzumab group did about 37.5% better, it wasn't statistically significant. Nonetheless, if you put all of this information together, it looks as if alentuzumab is a very effective drug. And it's also perhaps leading to a paradigm shift in the way we start to think about MS. So now we're really able to approach the holy grail of disease-free activity. And in these trials, one defines disease-free activity as a person who has no clinical relapses, no sign of disability progression, and no sign of any new disease on MRIs during the two years of this study. And as you can see here, nearly 40% of the patients receiving alentuzumab achieved that disease-free status for that two-year period. But of course, we have to always remember safety first. And there are problems with alentuzumab. Um, because this is a potent agent that wipes away all, all lymphocytic activity, or almost all lymphocytic activity, uh, there's a differential rate of return of the types of lymphocytes that start to come back, which seems to alter regulation of the immune response. And one of the side effects of uh, alentuzumab or lemtrada that we're concerned about is the presence of other autoimmune phenomenon. And the most uh, significant one that's developed is that the blood platelets, which are necessary for clotting, uh, can be dramatically reduced, the condition called thrombocytopenia. And that has occurred in about 1% of patients. And so patients have to be monitored very closely, and if that develops, they need other, other treatments. More common than that, although generally less serious, are thyroid problems from an autoimmune uh, attack on the thyroid, and so about 20% of patients taking alentuzumab develop thyroid abnormalities. And that can generally be managed medically, but is something that, that needs attention. And then there have been some other rare um, autoimmune phenomena that have occurred with alentuzumab. Also, because the lymphocyte counts are very low for quite some time, there's the potential that unusual infections or other conditions could occur. We haven't seen that so far uh, to any significant extent, but it remains a possibility. So my guess is that when Lemtrada gets approved, which likely will be in the fall of 2013, it will probably be reserved as a treatment for people who are failing other therapies. Now, this is a slightly complicated slide about another um, agent that's being tested, another monoclonal antibody, as you can tell because it ends in MAB, called Declizumab. This drug's being tested subcutaneously and uh, only being given currently, I think, once a month subcutaneously. And th the way this drug works is there, this is a, uh, a drug um, that's a, uh, an, an antibody de against another marker on the surface of uh, T lymphocytes called CD25. And by affecting CD25, blocking CD25, this allows another chemical called IL2 to um, not be consumed by that lymphocyte. Uh, so when, I, when CD25 is blocked, IL2 remains in the circulation, and it's then available to stimulate yet another population of um, immune cells 
called, um, called NKCD56 bright cells. So you don't need to remember that name, but those cells are involved in regulating the immune response and in down, uh, down regulating the inflammatory response. So this is a so somewhat complicated mechanism of action, but the bottom line is it decreases inflammation again. And this uh, trial had a study known as the SELECT study that was called a, a, a phase two trial, probably because it was only a one-year study. But it was a fairly large study uh, of about 600 patients with two different doses of diclizumab against placebo. And as you can see, again, there was a very substantial reduction, uh, well over 50% in uh, the annualized relapse rate. There was also, despite the fact that this was uh, only a one-year trial, and it's very hard even in a two-year trial to show a reduction in the progression of disability, here they achieved that in only a one-year trial, and also showed a, a large percentage of patients who were completely free of relapses during that one year. So this is another very attractive uh, schedule of administration, taking one sub-Q shot once a month, way better than taking daily sub-Q injections or three times a week sub-Q injections. But we still need to learn more about the safety of this agent. And this agent is currently in a phase three trial. Now earlier, Dr. Loveland was talking a little bit about rituximab. Uh, rituximab or rituxan is a drug that's on the market it treats certain lymphomas, but it also is on the market now to treat rheumatoid arthritis. It's yet another monoclonal antibody. This time it's directed against a protein that's on the surface only of B cells. So it gets rid of B cells. Uh, it had a, a positive phase two trial in relapsing remitting MS that was quite uh, successful. Uh, but uh, attention was switched to another closely related agent called ocrelizumab. Um, this is the data from rituximab, which shows a very striking reduction. In phase two trials in MS, these trials are all done by doing frequent MRIs on patients. If you remember the curve that showed all the yellow arrows, there were a lot more yellow arrows than there were relapses in MS. So that enables us, if in a study, to do a lot of MRIs and pick up more disease activity so you can study the drug uh, for a shorter period of time, and that's done in phase two trials. The FDA, however, will not license a drug based on MRI activity. It requires the demonstration of a clinical benefit. That's why all the phase three trials are longer, typically two-year studies, um, looking at clinical activity as well as MRI. But in any case, uh, in the rituximab phase two trial, you can see the striking and rapid reduction in the MRI activity, almost, almost to zero. Well, rituximab is, uh, is a partly uh, a mouse molecule. It's partly a mouse antibody. And there are some advantages to having a more fully humanized antibody. And ocrelizumab um, does the same thing as rituximab, but as, uh, as an anti-CD20 agent. But it's a more fully humanized molecule. Well, when the attention was switched to ocrelizumab, that required that a new phase two trial be done with ocrelizumab, which delayed the whole development of this type of agent. But this has now been accomplished, and essentially it exactly replicated what we saw with uh, rituximab. Here again, this is MRI activity. Here is uh, in the, the placebo arm and an interferon arm that was included in this study, I think in purple here. Um, and here are two different doses of ocrelizumab. Again, essentially shutting off MRI activity. So this drug is now well along in phase three trials, both in relapsing remitting MS and in primary progressive MS. Any of you have cats? <laughs> we have a couple of cats and we don't like to be caught in this situation. Uh, he's telling the cat, never ever think outside the box. But uh, when we're developing new treatments, we do sometimes want to think outside the box. So let's get away for a moment from um, these pharmacological agents and talk a little bit about, about stem cells. Uh, uh, Dr. Loveland started that conversation. I think when most of you think about stem cells, you think about these cells that have gotten a lot of um, discussion in the media 
embryonic stem cells that potentially have the ability to develop into any kind of cell in the body. Well, we're getting away from this uh, uh, moral and philosophical conversation because we now can actually develop those kinds of cells from other tissues, so we don't really need to go to embryos. And yet the attention in MS is really pretty much away from those kinds of cells. The thought, the, the very simplest, simplistic and probably incorrect uh, and irrelevant concept here was, well, we've got uh, cells that don't make myelin, we've got broken myelin, we'll squirt in some of these stem cells that can develop into anything, they'll get into the brain and the nervous system, they'll go to the right places, and they'll start making myelin and fix the whole problem. Um, I think that that kind of notion was fostered by Christopher Reeve's foundation and so on, but it's really uh, probably um, not ever going to happen that way. And MS is not the kind of disease that's likely to get fixed by that. There are a lot of issues with that kind of approach. Number one, um, are they safe? How do we know that those cells will go to the right places and do the right things and not, for example, turn into cancers? How do we get them to go to the right place? How do we tell one of those cells to become an oligodendrocyte, a cell that makes myelin, and not become a liver cell? So there are a lot of, there are a lot of issues with that. And, and so I think more attention has turned to other types of stem cells. There's been a lot of attention over years to um, what are now referred to as uh, hematopoietic stem cells. And these are not what I think most of you are thinking about when you think about stem cells. These are not cells that can turn into any kind of cell in the body, but they're cells that can turn into any kinds of immune cells or, or blood cells. And this is, this is a therapy that's been done in many, many centers, but overall around the world, relatively few patients have undergone the procedure for MS, maybe about 600 patients. And what happens here is the idea is you, um, you harvest cells from the individual. Now we do them, they can be harvested from a different individual, but most of the attention now is from taking your own hematopoietic stem cells. So you get them out of the blood. You can get them out of the bone marrow also, but that's more painful and difficult. So now we mainly get them out of the, the blood. So first you have to give some drugs to mobilize these stem cells so that you get enough of them into the blood to harvest. So that has a little bit of risk, uh, but not too bad. Then you collect, then you collect these stem cells, as seen in this second vertical column, and then comes the, the, the most, perhaps the most critical phase, what's called the conditioning phase or the conditioning regimen. And here what you're doing basically is giving chemicals that are completely obliterating the individual's immune, uh, uh, immune capability. And you're trying to reset the thermostat. You're taking and trying to create a, a blank slate so that you hopefully have gotten rid in this conditioning regimen of all the cells that are programmed to do bad things to your central nervous system. And then you give back these earlier stem cells, which can then develop into cells that don't have that negative potential. The problem with this is that you, A, have given uh, very potent drugs to completely obliterate the immune system, and you've gone through a phase of several weeks, called here the aplastic phase, when you essentially don't have an immune system. And we have an immune system for very good reason, to fight infections, to fight cancer cells, and various other things. And during that period, you're at considerable risk of something bad happening. And in fact, even though uh, the centers that have been doing this procedure have been steadily able to reduce the risk from this procedure, even at the current time, the best risk is, is a mortality rate of about 1.3%. So this is not a therapy that you undertake lightly. And so in the earlier, trials with hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, they were looking at more advanced patients because it was a risky treatment. But it doesn't work very well in advanced patients. So now you've got to try to balance who should you do this risky procedure to. So suffice it to say, this has continued to be looked at. It's very difficult 
to plan properly controlled trials of this kind of therapy, um, but it is being done. Now, the other kind of stem cells that are interesting are called mesenchymal stem cells, and these are um, progenitor cells that can be collected from many, many different types of connective tissue. They're probably most typically now being gotten from the bone marrow. And they don't have the capability to develop into all kinds of uh, other cells, but they do have the, the uh, ability to develop into certain other kinds of cells. And it turns out that these uh, kinds of stem cells, if they are f effective, it's probably not actually because they're landing in the central nervous system and growing there. They're probably actually doing other things. So they may be able to recruit um, cells that are the precursors of oligos and direct them to become mature oligodendro cells and make myelin. They might be able to, um, uh, to promote the um, secretion of chemicals, proteins that rescue nerve cells from programmed cell death. They might secrete factors that promote the growth of nerve fibers. <clears throat> they might further reduce inflammation and they might downregulate some activated inflammatory cells in the central nervous system. So they have many, many different functions. Um, and they act not only in the central nervous system, but most of them are trapped in the lungs or in the peripheral lymph nodes, and they probably uh, exert influences on the immunological system. So this form of therapy has a lot of potential still at this point, but the studies are still in their infancy and they're not really working the way people would have thought that stem cells worked. Now, we used to be taught that MS was a disease of myelin. It was a, it was a white matter disease. And as you've seen from earlier speakers today, MS extensively involves the gray matter, the cerebral cortex, which is probably why it partly affects cognition. And these um, areas here are plaques in the, in the cortex. This bridges the cortex and the white matter. This whole white area is cortex, and there's only a little area of preserved <coughs> myelin within it. But just within the last couple of weeks, we've seen a report in a major neurological journal that indicates um, that there is the capacity of oligodendrocytes to repair, uh, to repair myelin and, and to protect, um, thereby probably to protect axons within the cerebral cortex. And these little red arrows are pointing to brown staining cells, which are oligodendrocytes. And, whoops, I'm sorry. And in these paddles, you can see the outgrowth of fibers from these oligos, uh, which are forming new myelin, and here you can see a newly or a remyelinated uh, fiber in the cortex. So this is very exciting. It indicates that we do have the capacity to regenerate and repair uh, neurological structures within the cerebral cortex as well as within the white matter, and we just have to find a better way to be able to do that. And so there's a lot of attention that's being paid to mechanisms or drugs that can help us remyelinate, remyelinate the nervous system. And one such relevant molecule is a molecule called Lingo-1, which inhibits the differentiation of oligodendrocytes. So they can't, these precursor cells can't turn into mature oligos and also inhibits axonal regeneration. And there has now been the development of a monoclonal antibody against Lingo-1, an anti-Lingo-1 antibody, which has been shown to be able to promote the development of remyelination. And this happens to be an experimental rodent. I think it's a mouse. Um, and myelin in these sections stains blue. So the bluer you see something, the more myelinated it is. And I want to call your particular attention to these, this area of this mouse spinal cord which relates to certain sensory functions. And this is a, a, a mouse who um, uh, has uh, a condition in which he's only receiving 
uh, random immunoglobulin. And this mouse, it was given a disease which caused the demyelination. Um, I think this is experimental allergic encephalomyelitis. And here, the mouse received antilingo-1. And you see that the mouse was able to repair those dorsal columns. This is another model. I want to call your attention particularly to the bottom frames here. Um, th this is a different model. This is a model in which the animal is given a chemical called cuprazone, which destroys myelin. And if you give, uh, if you don't give antilingo, it's a little hard to see from here. Uh, this is the right-hand panels here are a mouse that's not given antilingo. And you don't see much, many red dots here. And here is after four weeks, and here is anti, after six weeks of, of antilingo, and you're seeing staining of, of the myelin sheaths, which you also can see up here in the panel above. These dark rings are myelin, um, which is being repaired. So um, this tells us that there's a significant potential of antilingo-1 at least in experimental animals, to promote remyelination. And antilingo-1 uh, is now in cl clinical trials. It's just now moving into a phase two trial. Phase one safety trials have been completed. So that offers the hope that we will be able to repair the nervous system. So I think throughout the day, you've seen that we have lots of ways to help people with MS. Uh, both with pharmacological approaches and others, and if all else fails, there's always the couch. <laughs>